All right, everyone, welcome to Actaris Spring 2020 Lecture Series, Leakages in the Landscape, Harnessing Functional Ecology to Feed the Planet and to Fight Climate Change. My name is Robbie Brown, as you can probably tell by my Zoom background, and I am the Community Engagement Associate for Actera. Before we begin, just a few things to go over with the Zoom application. Uh, we do have a live chat box right now, so if you guys feel the need to communicate, please feel free to type a message in there. Uh, there will be a Q&A portion of this event after our five-minute intermission. Uh, please feel free to submit any questions that you might have for Chance during his presentation by accessing that Q&A tab, which should be in the lower uh, portion of your Zoom application. I can't guarantee that Chance will answer every question, but he certainly will try his best to, to go through them all. So if you're not familiar with Actera, we are a San Francisco Bay Area nonprofit based in Palo Alto. We largely focus on bringing people together to create local solutions for a healthy planet. Our lecture series falls under our educational programming where we have a key goal of compelling the wider public to recognize the urgency of our current climate crisis, as well as to inspire them to take appropriate actions needed. In our education programming, we have three core areas. So we have the climate resilient communities. Uh, we work on empowering and alleviation of climate impacts for the under-resourced neighborhoods. We also have the Youth Be the Change, which is a leadership and educational program based around the topic of climate. And then like this lecture, we have our public lecture series where we invite leading voices from academia, business, and policy to discuss global climate change issues. I'd also like to address some of the upcoming events that Actera is hosting. So May 27th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., we have a free event with our executive director, Lauren Weston. This is a virtual coffee hour session and it gives you a chance to engage in a conversation with her about Actera's programming and future direction. Uh, this particular one for May 27th is going to be focused on the topic of food, health, and sustainability. Then May 28th from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m., we have a free event, which is the 30th Anniversary Business Environmental Awards Online Ceremony. We invite you guys to join us for an inspiring evening of celebrating innovative and sustainable business practices. We also will have a live panel discussion about the, about, uh, sorry, the evolution of sustainability in business. And of course, an exciting after party that you will not want to miss. If you are a young professional, I encourage you to register for our Young Professionals Virtual Happy Hour. This will be a night filled with opportunities to network with other young professionals interested in sustainability. You can get more information about how to be involved in our Young Professionals group. And we will also be hosting an environmentally themed trivia. This is June 4th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And this is also a free event. On June 9th from 7 to 8.30 p.m., we have our online electrical vehicle workshop, Everything You Need to Go EV. This is gonna be a presentation covering a wide variety of the basics for EV ownership, such as the benefits of having an electric vehicle, government rebates, battery range and charging basics, and more. And then we rescheduled with Anthony Mitt for our last lecture series for this season. It's entitled Eating Our Way Out of the Climate Crisis, Turning Bad Emissions into Good Soil Carbon. This will be June 24th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. This will be a free event just like this one. Uh, currently the registration is not live, but we plan to have the registration live by the end of this week. Next, we wouldn't be able to continue to host our lecture series without our amazing underwriters and sponsors for their support. So I would like to thank Marion Clinton Gilliland and Armand and Elaine Newkermans as well as our series sponsors, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and the Foster in Palo Alto. The man presenting today is Chance Cutrano. Chance Cutrano is a director of programs at Resource Renewal Institute in Marin. Chance's work centers around large landscape conservation from the, preser uh, excuse me, the preservation of wildlife and national parks to the restoration of biodiversity and agricultural ecosystems. Most recently, Chance has been developing fish in the fields a sustainable aquaculture program to grow fish in the Sacramento, Sacramento uh, Valley rice fields. And in addition to his work at Resource Renewal Institute, Chance serves as a vice chair for the Sierra Club San Francisco Bay chapter. And he holds numerous appointments, boards, and commissions in Marin County. 
So I am about to hand it off to Chance to begin his presentation. He's going to be presenting for roughly 30 minutes. And then, like I stated earlier, we'll have a intermission, which is five minutes. And after that intermission, we'll have a 20 minute Q&A session. Chance, are you ready to take it over? Yeah, absolutely, Robbie. Thank you. Great. Thanks. OK, um, let me share my screen here. Can you can you all see that? Robbie, is that good? Yeah, looks great. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. I'm, I'm really excited and I was honored that Actera reached out and offered to uh, have me participate in this lecture series. Uh, I thought the best topic for me, given the other amazing speakers in the series uh, from University of California researchers uh, to Anthony Mint, um, I thought I would try to figure out a way to sort of tie that farm to table experience all the way together. So the way I explained it in my, in my outreach was, you know, tying it from soil to sky. Uh, because the work that I do in the Central Valley really is this beautiful web uh, that, that connects all of those pieces from microbes in the soil all the way up to migratory birds uh, and shorebirds. So uh, with that said, um, I'm going to hop on in. And I thought the outline might be great to, for setting the stage. So we're dealing with a hungry world. We're dealing with an increasingly empty world in terms of animals. And we're, of course, confronting uh, a much warmer world. And uh, the next step is sort of making that call to action that you know, agriculture is a part of this. And it has contributed in a lot of negative ways to uh, to those, those very issues. And perhaps if we rethink our relationship with nature through uh, an agricultural prism, we might be able to leverage that to feed people, uh, fight climate change, and help biodiversity rebound. Uh, and then I'm gonna, of course, give a little bit of a US case study, my personal experience, how I came to this issue. Uh, I think it's really fascinating. And then I'm gonna scale it out a little bit and, and make sure people realize that it's not just about, you know, this one-off sort of idea, this one-off project, but it's happening all around us, all around the world. And then we can have that discussion. So, of course, jumping on in, you know, the world population by 2050 is expected to be nearly 10 billion, and that is supposed to increase again by the end of the century. Uh, hopefully at that point, we'll see a plateau due to uh, sort of the repopulation rates decreasing over time, um, but it's sort of a lagged effect. So even if that's happening now globally, we're gonna still see an increase um, until that, that lag catches up. Um, it's sort of like a delayed feedback loop. Um, and of course, with that increasing population uh, around the world and in a growing middle class or lower middle class really, what we're seeing is uh, increase in meat consumption, uh, whether it's cattle, poultry, pork. Uh, this is, as this chart illustrates, growing rapidly. And this is something that we'll definitely have to confront because that is contributing negatively to land use change, different uh, petrol-based uh, or petroleum-based fertilizer inputs, et cetera. Um, so that's the first piece of this, this puzzle. Uh, the second piece is biodiversity loss in general. So uh, every day, I'm sure you all see, it's kind of crazy, like in social media, in the news, uh, every day I'm getting new updates of new studies that are adding to this, this overwhelming body of evidence that we're confronting widespread ecological collapse. Uh, as this, this graphic illustrates, you know, one in four birds, and that's roughly three billion birds in North America, gone since 1970. Uh, it's sort of hard to fathom, you know, I, I think, you know, we're seeing increasingly empty skies uh, and increasingly empty oceans and even, even insects. I grew up on the south side of Chicago and I used to see lightning bugs all the time. Uh, and, and now it's, it's sort of like a, a treasure to see something like that. So uh, that's the other piece that we're confronting. Um, the last May, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, try saying that three times fast, they actually reported that the current rate of extinction is tens to hundreds of times higher 
than average over the past 10 million years. And, and it's accelerating. Uh, and this isn't just coming from the scientific community, it's also coming from the business community. So the World Economic Forum, they release an annual global risk report, sort of getting a sense from people in the field, people in business, uh, people in government, what are the top risks that they, they see on the horizon? And this year, uh, biodiversity loss topped their list with likely impactful long-term risks. Uh, so, you know, while we don't really know the full impact of this loss, we do know that, you know, as the world becomes increasingly warm, uh, it's going to continue to destabilize our food security, our, our supply chain stability, and really the, the overall our overarching vision for sustainable development. Um, I think the pandemic is a perfect example of this, just to tie in COVID, but when you see agricultural land use change, when you see warmer climates, uh, you're going to see increasing vectors and concentration of wildlife that can, can spread these diseases, these zoonotic diseases, and then spread them to, to livestock as well, or, or however we handle them in wet markets as well for wildlife trade. So bringing it back to sort of the California case um, and the US case as opposed to the global case, uh, one of the interesting things is uh, the average daily temperature in California is expected to increase uh, nearly 8.8% by the end of the century, 5.6 5 .5 to 8.8%. And with that increase, in addition to diseases and all that other stuff that I was just mentioning, you have a decrease in water scarcity, which in the West, in a, a place that's very agriculture risk like, risk, uh, rich like California is, we're gonna see a rapid reduction in Sierra snowpack, which 23 to 25 million Californians rely on. And not only that, but people who export products all around the world, all around the United States will feel the, the impact of this water loss. And the red is just an illustration of that diagonal blue decreasing. Um, and overall, that's going to have a huge impact on our food security, not only a reduction in crop yields of 2 to 11 percent by the end of the century, but we're also talking about uh, crop nutrition, soil health, the integrity of the food that we're eating, which creates all kinds of macro and micronutrient losses uh, for communities around the country and around the world. So, you know, this is, this is right here in our backyard. This is something that we have to confront. And, uh, you know, agriculture plays a significant role in perpetuating this, not just in, that, in the United States, but globally. Uh, agriculture has led to, uh, agricultural and other industrial land use expansion has led to a loss of over 85% of global wetlands. It's a fact that a lot of people don't realize, but, uh, you think about deforestation, for instance. Uh, what, we lose wetlands internationally at a rate three times greater than that of deforestation. Uh, it's just those, you know, they're sort of a middle ground use. They're, people historically haven't valued them properly. And so those are very quick to go. It, agricultural expansion has also altered about 75% of the land surfaces of the United States, or of, of the globe. And, impacted 66% of ocean areas. Uh, and you think maybe that is from uh, not only overfishing and overharvesting for consumption, but this is also overharvesting to create fish meal and fish feed that serves as livestock feed to continue the, the meat consumption. So we're not eating down the food chain, but we're using all these lower value, seemingly lower value fish uh, and other aquatic resources, and we're feeding them to land-based aquaculture, we're feeding them to land-based livestock, et cetera, or, make, or even fertilizer. So, you know, there are a lot of big impacts globally. And, you know, I'm sure some of you have seen this Bloomberg uh, graphic. I, I think it's fantastic, just because it, it puts into perspective just how much of the United States actually goes to agricultural uses. Um, so, even though biodiversity underpins our, our global food system, the, our domestic food system, uh, we've removed so much biodiversity and so much natural habitat to make way for 
I mean, you see from this map, the majority of it's for cows. Uh, in addition to livestock feed, in addition to feed exports, and then there's also the food we eat. Uh, and then if you include agroforestry and plantations and timberland, uh, that's a whole other piece of land use change and, and uh, agriculture. Um, but I think the interesting piece about this is to illustrate that you know, while there are all these negative effects around the world from agriculture, you know, in the United States, agriculture land, uh, agricultural land makes up 45%, even over half of our overall land use and land area. And you, you kind of have to think that that illustrates that it probably plays an important role in combating climate change, the worst effects of biodiversity loss, uh, and our efforts to continue to feed people. Um, and at least that's what I thought. Uh, and yet, uh, as of 20, 2018, the actual uh, states around the United States with climate adaptation plans, um, there are about 18 of them. And of those 18, there are actually maybe only a couple that are actually doing innovative things, thinking about how they must actually adjust crop production, crop diversity, et cetera, to deal with new heat, new drought, new disease stressors. And a lot of them are sort of boilerplate templates of you know, aspirations, what we're going to do to eventually overcome climate risks for agriculture. Uh, and so of those 18, there's so few that are actually innovative and even fewer are thinking about how do we make agricultural working landscapes actually part of the larger ecosystem. So instead of viewing these things uh, in, in isolation, trying to kill all the pests, eradicate it so we can have large monocrop industrial production, uh, we're thinking, um, you know, we're, 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 it's sort of business as usual uh, for a lot of these states, especially ones in the Midwest that are facing a lot of, of climate risk. Um, so this kind of gets into, you know, that sets the stage. This sort of section of my talk wanted to sort of get into what we could be bringing to this conversation. Uh, and I, I've been extremely fortunate in my career to have done research on numerous continents about food, water, and energy policy. Uh, I did some time, I had some, spent some time in Vietnam as well as Morocco and Bolivia. And it, I didn't connect the dots until now. Uh, of course, that's how it always goes. Hindsight's twenty twenty, But there are all these global agricultural heritage systems that have been effectively feeding people for thousands of, thousands of years. Uh, the one you see on the left of the screen here is probably the most common that you think about uh, would be um, you know, the rice terraces of Southeast Asia. And in addition to those rice terraces, you also get the idea that um, you know, food uh, is not only grown, but they, they have biodiversity of birds, shorebirds. You have fish that are intercropped with rice in these ecosystems. And that's something that I actually was, had the privilege of coming across while I was spending time in Vietnam, uh, is, is fish, rice, duck, polyculture systems. So they're growing all those things either sequentially or simultaneously. In the center, this is actually a depiction of you know, an ancient practice in another place uh, in the Altiplano of uh, Bolivia in the Andes. And that's something I also had the privilege of coming across and I didn't even connect the dots uh, until I came back to the United States. But this is, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, there were pre-Hispanic civilizations at Tiwanaku and other settlements that were using innovative models of growing fish and and food and the way that they actually altered the land use over time in order to deal with different climatic issues that they were experiencing. And, and then the other piece, this final one, I didn't have a good photo actually, so this is the closest representation I could have, um, but where I lived in Vietnam, it was so strange. There were these like, we had these like four story buildings where, where my home was, it was like suburban Kanto in, in Vietnam in the Southern region, the Mekong River Delta. And, after every house, alongside every house, it wasn't like they were stacked house, house, house. It was house, and then this, this large tract of land, house, large tract of land. I mean, it was just like another plot right next to it. Same footprint as maybe the house. 
but it was it wasn't like a traditional garden like you might have like a little plot here it was like the whole thing was wild and there were banana trees and they had all of these different medicinal herbs and spices and things that they were putting in their soup and putting in their tea and uh, you know putting in their meals and i think you know that's another piece of this agricultural heritage system or having really urban and suburban food forests and and having a different relationship to food where you could be more resilient within your own household, within your own community. And they've maintained those, the integrity of those systems, even though they're, they're modernizing and developing, but through their land use planning and zoning, they maintained those systems. And I thought it was so interesting. So, you know, those are just a couple examples that we could carry with us into how we deal with agriculture in the United States as we as we begin to adapt. And that's where I think, you know, getting into fish in the fields is is probably really interesting because it's like fish and rice polyculture is something that could possibly happen in the United States or anywhere rice is grown. And lo and behold, when I came back from this trip abroad, I was able to connect to uh, the Resource Renewal Institute, which was doing conservation aquaculture in rice fields, uh, stocking salmon fingerlings and having them grow out in these former floodplain ecosystems when rice fields are flooded in the winter. And we decided to sort of experiment with this, building out something more commercial. So how can we create a second crop for rice farmers, uh, a second income, something that's very resilient. And, and that's where fish in the fields, large landscape conservation, and functional ecology come into play. Uh, really honoring those those heritage agriculture systems that I was just mentioning. So um, here's a like people don't really realize how much rice is grown in the United States. Uh, you might get your Cal Rose or you, you might get rice from uh, Stuttgart uh, or Lone Oak, Arkansas. Uh, a lot of rice is grown in the Mississippi Delta, but we actually have uh, over 500,000 acres of rice grown here in California, north of Sacramento. This map is an illustration of, of that. You have Sacramento down here, and here's all of the rice growing region um, that, that is sort of the, one of the primary uses of the water that comes off the Sierra foothills. It goes, it floods these rice fields, and then some of it percolates, some of it evaporates, but the majority of it continues onward and, and is used for uh, urban and suburban uses, as well as other agricultural uses and in-stream flow downstream for fish. So, uh, the interesting thing about, about rice and, and putting it into historical context, on the left here, early 1800s, all of the Central Valley where we grow all our food today, it was all wetlands, it was all floodplains, it was tule marshes, and, and seasonal wetlands as well, and, and, and some grasslands, shrublands, etc. But you can see now to the early 2000s, uh, all that brown is, that's all agriculture. All of it was reclaimed by the Army Corps of Engineers, by USDA, uh, because it was very fertile soil. And with that loss of wetland, um, we really didn't see the feedback loops uh, immediately. And we've only been seeing them through the 20th century, really. But we've actually lost 95% of our wetlands here in California. It's one of the more dramatic places where we've lost wetlands in the United States, but it speaks to that same global context, the 85% internationally that, that are lost. Here in California, it's even more extreme. And uh, right there is sort of where the rice growing region is up in that, that top part. So in the 90s, uh, there was a, a landmark law that came into place. Historically, rice was burned in those 250 to 500,000 acres. Uh, right after all the rice was harvested, they had all this remaining straw and it was all burned and it was just part of the season. But because of the carbon monoxide, smog emissions, et cetera, and uh, various other pollutants, particulate matter, et cetera, they actually passed a law in the 90s saying, you can't burn that rice straw anymore. You have to flood those fields to decompose the remaining rice straw in the winter when you're done growing your rice. And you can see in this, uh, this, this top graphic, uh, rice straw management, uh, decrease and burn, and you increase the incorporation back into the fields. You plow it back in, you let it decompose by flooding those fields. Um, 
and lo and behold, something amazing happened with that same increase in, uh, in flooding, you also have a new increase in waterfowl habitat. And this is just, you know, that correlation speaks for itself that that orange and the winter flooded rice acreage um, and the ducks. So that is where the story sort of begins is like a uh, sort of amazing thing that agriculture could do is provide habitat and provide this linkage in the landscape. Uh, so it, it plays this amazing new role in our Pacific Flyway and rice in the, the middle of the country in the Mississippi Delta also plays an important role in the Central Valley as well. Um, so this is a, a graphic overlay that I put on top from Ducks Unlimited, but you can see those little red dots are sort of all the important nesting areas uh, along the Pacific Flyway, places to get food energy, places to rest, and right in smack dab in the middle is, uh, you know, that's, that's rice country. That's rice country. So that is uh, one of the amazing things about rice ecosystems, wetland ecosystems, and, and that overlap that that rice can provide um but uh you know as we continue to develop the state as more people want to move to california as we face increasing droughts and droughts just become the new normal uh we have new issues um and and rice farmers are being taken over by orchardists that you know that their water down south is not as uh is attainable uh, and there are new laws coming that are putting restrictions on how much water you can pull out of the ground in the southern central valley san joaquin valley and so a lot of the folks that are actually going and looking for for water for sale for land that has good access to water it, are orchardists almond growers etc um, up and, and they're acquiring these rice fields so this is a risk that if we lose these rice fields we can lose millions of migratory uh, waterfowl as well as shorebirds uh, in addition to potentially other issues that we, we don't really yet understand. Uh, and I have a little video that, that kind of breaks this down as well. Today, this field produces tons of nutritious rice, but it has the potential to do so much more. When these rice fields are flooded for the winter, magical things begin to happen. So now we flood about 250,000 acres of rice fields in the wintertime. And this has become a major component of the Pacific Flyway for not only ducks and geese and swans, but all of the myriad of other shorebirds that we have in the environment. These flooded fields are teeming with microscopic life, too. The mixture of rice straw, water, and sunlight creates plenty blooms producing 150 times the biomass found in rivers and streams. And now, we found the key to unlocking a whole new world of benefits. Inspired by the age-old practice of fish and rice co-cultivation, Fish in the Fields radically reimagines farming in California's 500,000 acres of rice with one simple solution. Growing fish in these plankton-rich flooded rice fields in the off-season. Fish in the Fields optimizes rice production systems, providing farmers with a second crop while mitigating climate change. The benefits seem to be revealing themselves to us. This year, we found that by adding fish to flooded rice fields, we can reduce methane emissions by as much as 90%. So you're talking about creating all this protein while having a carbon negative effect. Finding a fit that works in a synergistic, a natural and a sustainable way is, it's like a unicorn, that'd be what we call it, right? It's the idea of this thing that, that rarely exists, but when it does, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Together, with our diverse cast of nonprofit, business, and public sector partners, Fish in the Fields is working to create win-win solutions for people and the planet. Today, so um, that's just an example of, uh, that's sort of an intro video to sort of uh, provide people with some context for what we're actually doing in the Sacramento Valley. So uh, Huey Johnson, the founder of Resource Renewal Institute, sitting out in a duck blind and had this, this vision, you know, we can hunt ducks, we can 
you know, create all this, this wetland habitat, there's got to be an additional use and maybe we can grow fish. And lo, you know, little did he know, he likes to say that, you know, once he got on the internet and started looking into it, you could tie, uh, you could attach the number of publications about fish and rice co-cultivation on a string from San Francisco all the way to, uh, to China, you know. Um, there are just so many publications about this because it is a heritage agricultural system. And it's one that we're working to adopt here in the United States. So, um, you know, fish in the fields is, is a couple different things. It's, right now it's a, it's a nonprofit project, but it's also a social benefit corporation committed to growing fish in California's flooded rice fields when they sit idle in the off season. It's a product uh, um, that is creating additional productivity for rice farmers. And it's a process that's requiring no additional land, water, or feed while actually like leveraging ecological principles to fight climate change, mitigate methane as uh, the speakers in that video all shared. And it's a promise. It's a commitment to creating a landscape that works better for people and the planet. Um, and here's how it works. So this is what a traditional rice production system looks like in the Central Valley. So fields are flooded April and May and the rice is planted and it grows for a 120 day growing season until the fall when the rice is harvested and the fields are drained. The fields are then reflooded and they allow uh, decomposition of the remaining rice straw that's left per the, the laws on the books. Um, this also provides winter waterfowl habitat. And this is where fish in the fields comes in. So we actually take fish from our hatchery and we plant them in these winter flooded fields where they grow naturally on abundant plankton and until they're harvested in the spring when the fields are drained so they can be prepared for the next rice uh, season and those fish can be connected with sustainable protein supply chains. So with this one simple change to how we do rice production in California, we can actually unlock year round productivity from these fields, along with the myriad benefits for biodiversity, for, for waterfowl, for shorebirds, as uh, the rice farmer Charlie Matthews explained. And these little fish make a big difference. So while fish are growing, Fish in the Fields actually offers up to a 65% reduction in methane. And we think we can actually tweak it to be even more. You know, methane is 25 times, 30 times worse than CO2 as a greenhouse gas, uh, as far as heating potential, global heating potential. And it only lasts so long. So it's actually important to address things like methane now because it's really hot right now and it's, it's so much stronger than CO2. The other thing is we're growing native fish uh, for a world that's really demanding the sustainably sourced protein, as I previously mentioned. Uh, fish in the Fields aims to capture, you know, all kinds of different markets, but one of them, one of the good initial markets is sustainable pet food, uh, just in terms of getting this off the ground and showing the profitability of this. So I actually have a product in my hand here, um, but this is just an example of, you know, dehydrated fish as a product. And there are other products that we've actually been developing as far as uh, different product lines, but um, we could talk more about that uh, during the Q&A. And then finally, the rice farmers that participate benefit from new marketing tools for this methane fighting climate friendly rice and new incentives to ensure that winter water is available for wetland preservation. Um, and so a little bit about the methane mitigation, this is where the functional ecology comes in. So we knew that the fields were flooded, we knew that we could grow fish in those fields and that they could grow 50, 100% of their body weight, if not more, uh, over the course of the winter. What we didn't know is how to deal with something tricky like methane emissions. And the folks at Patagonia, uh, who generously supported this project, uh, they said, you know, you should try to figure out how to do something about methane emissions. And our team began researching this and we found that there are some studies that show fish introduced into freshwater ecosystems can have an effect on carbon cycling. 
And one of those was by Dr. Sean Devlin, who you saw in the video. And he actually found that in a lake in Finland, he put a curtain down the middle and in one side of it, there were fish and one side of it, there were no fish. And the fish, the side with the fish actually mitigated methane emissions from this freshwater lake. So our president at RRI, Deborah Moskowitz, reached out to Sean, brought him over here, and he thought we should test this out in rice fields. Lo and behold, over a, a couple of years, uh, and we have a paper forthcoming, we actually found that introduce, introduction of these plankton-eating fish back into these former habitats, back when they were floodplains and, temporary, and, and wetlands and seasonal wetlands, uh, introducing native fish back into these ecosystems actually totally changed the makeup of the microbial community. And so we put fish in, they ate the zooplankton, and the zooplankton were previously eating methane oxidizing microbes in the soil, uh, right on the surface of the soil. And so when you had no fish, you had a lot of methane coming out. Um, but when you put fish back in, they put grazing pressure on those zooplankton. And when there were less zooplankton, more of those bacteria could exist to actually oxidize the methane that was leaving the system. And so you're radically reducing the global warming potential of this plot of land just by putting fish back in the system. But it also has all those other benefits that I previously elaborated on. So that's just sort of like, this is something that still interests me about other ecosystems where we can, we can apply these same principles and better understand how microbes uh, and other fungi and, and protozoa, how, how they all affect carbon cycling. Um, and, and that's sort of a future area of study as well. And, you know, this, we could have done it with, without stakeholder engagement with different groups. Um, you know, there are other groups working in this space, uh, California Rice Commission, the Nature Conservancy, they have different mechanisms for promoting bird populations, the, the salmon project that I previously mentioned uh, with Cal Trout. Um, but, you know, our ranch partners, Patagonia, other private sector actors, in addition to our nonprofit sector actors, and all these government agencies have also been very supportive in this work. And I think that that's an essential piece. If we're going to try to honor and, and implement innovative uh, heritage uh, agricultural systems and try to tweak our systems that are that are conventional and and so based on monocrop so based on on uh, petroleum based agricultural systems if we're going to do that it's going to require a diverse cast such as this in order to make it happen and so these are the the players that I see and I identify as we move forward trying to expand here in California but also in Arkansas and other parts of the United States trying to raise fish in, in flooded rice fields. And, you know, scoping back out, coming up on time here, um, fish in the fields isn't a one-off. Uh, internationally in Europe right now, especially, um, there are different groups working on what are called integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. So instead of just having a, a pen with fish, you're actually looking holistically at the ecology of an aquatic ecosystem and you're saying, okay, well, let's put bivalves, let's put kelp and seaweed, uh, let's put crustaceans at the bottom, and you can grow all of these different uh, resources, products, uh, but they all play a different role and they all provide different ecosystem services. And so that's just a, an example of something that's exciting and, and sort of on the horizon in the aquaculture world, which is rapidly expanding. Um, and then you have groups like uh, Rodale and, and Patagonia and Dr. Bronner's who are, who've developed this regenerative organic certification. So if you see products in the marketplace, uh, they might start coming out with this certification, which is really a catch-all for all the good things. And, and, uh, and they're trying, this is sort of the, like a, supposed to be a flagship, but it's, it's really about regeneration of the soil, biodiversity, animal welfare, as well as good labor rights, um, all captured in one certification. Uh, so you don't have to go after the fair trade, organic, all those things uh, individually. They, products might have that in addition to having this certification or, or are required to have that in addition to this. Uh, and then you have payment for ecosystem services, uh, which is another, um, it's kind of a, it can be controversial because it's hard to measure and verify and report some of the ecosystem services that are provided, who actually gets the payment, is it corporations that 
own a forest or you know is it the, the people that tend the land how, how does that shake out so there's all these equity and justice pieces in smallholder farming internationally um, but also on the work that's being done domestically as well and uh, one of the exciting things is I, last I checked, as of 2018, over 550 active payment for ecosystem services programs. So paying for pollination, um, paying for uh, folks that are properly managing forests for water quality. Uh, these types of services actually are currently um, paying farmers, suppliers, and land managers an estimated 36 to $42 billion a year to ensure that they keep up those ecosystem services. And that's only the, the tipping point, uh, the, the, like the ice, tip of the iceberg, if you will. Um, you have all of these things that can come into effect when carbon taxes, you have all these carbon markets uh, looking to pay farmers for the carbon that they put into their soil uh, through perennial grasses and uh, no-till agriculture, et cetera. Um, so that's, uh, sort of where I'll leave it for this discussion. It's sort of a, a light touch on these problems, moving into you know, ins taking inspiration from these uh, heritage systems that communities around the world have given to us and that we can figure out how to tinker with to make our own communities closer to home even that much better. Um, and, and then looking at fish in the fields as an example of honoring this, this fish rice polyculture cropping system and, you know, Example, we can do it here, like we're actually doing it. Um, we, this fall, we expanded from a one acre plot to, uh, we have 50 acres under management nearly. Um, and, you know, uh, we're continuing to grow in a variety of ways and, and we're using native fish. So these are just some of the exciting things that are happening and uh, I look forward to speaking with y'all about it uh, now. Thank you, Chance. Just a incredibly fascinating and inspiring project. Uh, we are gonna take a brief five minute intermission. Uh, please continue to add and admit your questions in the Q&A tab, give Chance a, a moment to review them and he'll try to answer as many as possible. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing your screen, Chance, just real quick. Okay, fantastic, that concludes our five minute intermission. Chance, do you feel ready to start the Q&A session? 100%, yeah. Perfect, take it away. Yeah, so many good questions. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try to answer all of them, like rapid fire here a little bit. Um, so one of those uh, was, what are the, the fish that we're actually using? They are native fish. Um, currently we're using, a, a we tested the product project with, uh, you know, native salmon uh, for the restoration aspect of it. Uh, and then for the commercial aspect of it, we got our hands on like the number one bait fish in the United States, which is ubiquitous in California for uh, bass fishing, but it's called a, a golden shiner. So that's native to Arkansas, where we can continue to use that fish. Here in California, we're now uh, working with a native fish called the Sacramento blackfish. So this did exist in, the, uh, in that ecosystem prior to uh, reclamation of the wetland ecosystems. So that's the, the first one, um, and it's it's like the perfect fish. It, it, it dines on plankton, zooplankton, and insects and stuff. So great fish. Um, the another question from Craig and Joan: uh, How the fish are harvested? So, uh, and this also answers another question about the actual like like field. How how is the field managed? So all rice fields are laser leveled. Uh, and so the, the water flows via gravity. And that's one of the other amazing things about this project because it doesn't require any sort of mechanical movement of water um, right, in the, right in the rice check. Uh, where water is pumped from, it, de it depends on the region, but um, in the rice check, it all flows via gravity. So the water comes in, it's, it's filled with this abundance of food for fish. Uh, when we plant fish, they grow for three to four months. Uh, and then as the water drains via gravity, we have a catchment in the corner uh, that's like a little depression in the corner. And all of the fish are, they flow with the water and then they remain in that catchment. Uh, and, and then we come by and 
to date, we've been actually harvesting a couple different ways. One of them, uh, my least favorite, is me out there in waders for days uh, with giant nets. Um, but we hope to uh, have different ways to optimize that process. Um, that's just, you know, for some of our, our tests and stuff. Um, how will water scarcity in California impact rice fields moving forward? Question from Melanie, thank you. Uh, that is uh, an important question. I think water scarcity almost indirectly affects rice fields more than it directly affects rice fields. The reason I say this is because since rice fields are at the foothills of the, or at the mouth of, you know, the, the Sierra, um, all of the water kind of goes through rice, rice country first. And a lot of these rice farmers actually have what are called senior water rights. So uh, they actually have, you know, almost guaranteed rights to that, to use that water, um, or they can trade that water or sell that water in a voluntary market, like a water market, to other users downstream who, who need it and will pay them to use that water. So rice farmers have a better, um, have more security for water. I think the, the indirect threat, like I mentioned in the presentation, is there are lots of thirsty uh, businesses, uh, everything from, from almonds to walnuts to, to grapes and uh, you know, other orchard-like activities. And the big difference is you can fallow a rice field for a year or two if there's a drought and you can send your water elsewhere uh, to people in need or you know, something like that. But if you have an orchard, you're stuck with that orchard for, for 10, 20 years to get your investment. It's very expensive. And so you need to make sure that you keep getting water in order to keep those trees alive. And so that's the snafu is uh, orchards want to make sure they have water security. They're going up north, closer to the headwaters of the Sierra um, snowpack, and they're acquiring whatever land they can get their hands on, including rice fields. And so taking rice out of production, that's at least in my perspective, uh, one of the uh, more, more pressing issues. Um, question uh, from a couple people, Linda, Craig, um, et cetera. Uh, do water birds eat the fish? Yes. So it's sort of part of living with the land. And this is, this is that, how that practice happens elsewhere. But um, in our own financial models, in our models for the project, we anticipate a uh, certain degree, a certain percentage of the fish actually just feeding other uh, migratory birds and shorebirds in the ecosystem. Uh, in addition to, you know, this year found all kinds of crazy footprints from all little, kinds of furry little critters that were uh, checking out the rice fields. So it is, uh, we have wildlife cameras out there um, and there, there are various ways to deter uh, animals, especially around harvest time. But we found that as long as other fields are flooded, uh, it decreases the pressure on any one field. The longer we leave water on the field past all the other fields draining to try to keep our fish growing, the more likely it is that we'll run up against this issue. It'll, it'll be like a, uh, you know, the only place in town, the only saloon in town for all these uh, birds that are hungry. So we're like, you know, subsidizing all these egret and heron families. Um, let's see, uh, the best ways to help you on donating, uh, how could one get a career doing this kind of work? Um, there were a couple other questions. How do, um, how's the average citizen consumer support regenerative agriculture? I think it's all in the same vein. Um, two big moves probably. One would be voting. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, most climate plans don't include agriculture in the United States. That's, uh, that's not a, a defect or a bug that's just kind of like that's that's how it's set up you know there are a lot of a lot of uh, electeds that don't believe in climate change and so they they don't believe it's a real issue so we have to come to it in different and communicate about it in different ways using different lexicons and that's something that fish in the fields i've been learning how to do speaking with rice farmers who you know some of them don't want they don't want to be fish farmers uh and they're you know any land use change is uncomfortable, any change is uncomfortable. So, you know, working through that, providing technical support is essential. Uh, and so that's, that's important. Um, and, you know, part of that comes from politicians actually putting stuff on the books, but then actually funding it as well. It's, you know, if you can't enforce a law or if you can't actually fund the, the, the climate plans, 
then they're significantly weakened. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is voting with your dollar. Uh, and so, like I mentioned, uh, folks are creating new certifications. Uh, there are new companies, B Corps, and, and folks that are trying to do the right thing. And, you know, it might be a little more uh, in the short term as far as, a, you know, the price of a product, but in the long term, the dividends it pays, uh, it's hard to, to quantify at this point because we don't really know all about like what, what the true effects of biodiversity collapse really are or the, what climate change will really look like on the ground for everybody in frontline communities. Um, a question from Annie, I wonder if you thought about ways to package your products that don't involve plastic, always. So I, in my side stuff with Sierra Club, I, I'm constantly working on zero waste initiatives, uh, working on ordinance ban single use plastics in Marin County, single use foodware. So super concerned about it. Um, actually, there is polymer in, these, in this uh, product that I showed, but one of the other interesting things, it's also, there's also rice, it's also made of rice. Uh, so the hope is to lean into that and figure out how to use fibrous materials uh, in order to close loops and participate in that circular economy. And, and yeah, I hope, I hope to be uh, speaking about those types of initiatives uh, in the future about using fiber for, for a variety of purposes. Um, and then, uh, da, 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 um, Benefits, fertilizer benefits, there, in other countries, uh, there are benefits that have been documented for fish and rice polyculture systems. Uh, fish not only eating pests that help rice production, but also their, uh, their waste being a fertilizer, an orga uh, organic fertilizer for these rice paddy ecosystems. Uh, we have not done too much work in nutrient cycling, but if you know anybody that funds that type of work, send them my way, because we'd love to talk with them about that. Uh, and then I uh, mentioned, you know, I think I answered the objections piece. Uh, fish products for people directly, that's an end goal. You know, Yvonne Chouinard with Patagonia, um, you know, he always talks about eating down the food chain and, and the people at RRI are totally behind that. And, and I've had these fish myself. Uh, they're delicious, and trust me. But uh, we're focusing on on um, sort of the path of least resistance right now, um, and something that's really high margin. You know, it's uh, elsewhere in in the world. You know, fish, little fish chips like this in France and Mexico. Uh, it's it's a common food product. Uh, here, not so much. I mean, just fish in general. You know, we're, we're so used to a couple select fish species, and so hopefully we can continue to let our palates mature <laughs> as, we, as we continue to confront climate change and um, the need to switch up diets. Um, percentage of rice farmers participating, it's very small. So we, uh, pilot project, um, you know, working on rice, one rice farm, this year we expanded to three. Uh, and now we're in talks of expanding uh, even more. So it's really the, the bottleneck is just how quickly and how sustainably can we produce fish. Um, but yeah, so I think that's a lot of them. There was a question about Africa and the Green Revolution. And I think, you know, we've had folks reach out from Bhutan, folks reach out from uh, other places, uh, including Tanzania, good friends, uh, colleagues, I guess. I don't know, folks that found our, our materials uh, and reached out to me about technical assistance down in Tanzania with these types of projects. And I think it's something, it's, a, it's difficult. It's, there's pressure even within international organizations about you know, pushing strict technocratic monocrop production versus these agroecological systems and trying to right size agriculture. And I, I think that's something collectively that we, we continue to uh, confront. And it doesn't help that, um, there are a number of large corporations that own a, a large amount of land and put them into trusts and, you know, they, they trade them more as commodities and they treat them more as commodities than they treat them as food for actual people. Uh, and so that has an effect on land use change internationally, including in Africa. Um, but the, there's a lot of good work being done there too. I think it's also a, an equity justice piece about land tenure property rights in some of these uh, more, more uh, developing uh, nations. Um, I think that's a lot of the questions. Um, 
Yeah, uh, you know, anybody who wants to reach out to me, if there are other questions you have, please reach out to me. You can easily find me online. Just Google me or, uh, uh, yeah, drop me a line on LinkedIn or, or via email. Um, you know, I, the last thing I see is like a pan, the pandemic question. So I think for Fish in the Fields, it's just, it highlights how well positioned we are that we can bring food chains and, and food supply chains closer to where our markets actually are. And consumers really care about traceability and transparency of, of food supply chains. So having, you know, fish being raised in one of the most bucolic sort of environments uh, and, and telling this whole story and completing and this whole cycle of life in a rice paddy, um, it's, it's definitely uh, preferred compared to the intensive aquaculture that is, uh, that we're also kind of pressing up against. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, everybody for, for, for joining and all the support. Thank um, you for presenting chance. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting and informative. And thank you again to everyone that joined our spring lecture today. Um, I received a few questions, people asking if we are going to be uploading a recording of this event and we will be registered. You will be receiving a link to that video. Uh, thanks again for attending and everyone please stay safe and healthy.